If you don't literally live on the rock, you've heard about Akira Toriyama. Toriyama is considered by many the most iconic manga author that has ever lived. The man simply dominated the world with Dragon Ball, and not just that. Akira Sensei had a lot of success in the gaming world too, creating the designs for iconic games such as Chrono Trigger and Dragon Quest. His drawings have so much personality that you bat an eye on a panel and you instantly link the art to the artist. Dragon Ball kind of molded the manga industry. And not just because of its art, but above all, because of the way that Akira Toriyama tells stories. I don't know about you guys, but my favorite Dragon Ball is the classic one, with Kid Goku. I feel as the times were simpler, you know? I have some issues here and there with the sequences that I feel that many others have too. But today we're not here to pinpoint the problems of Dragon Ball. On today's video, I want to talk a little bit about one of the most underrated pieces of manga that I've ever seen. A manga that actually achieved the status of a cult manga. Today we're going to give some love to the most fun and interesting manga of Master Akira Toriyama, at least for me. Today we'll talk about Sand Land. Sandland is the epitome of Akira Toriyama. In the year 2000, five years after the serialization of Dragon Ball came to an end, Toriyama Sensei woke up in a beautiful day and thought, you know what? I really want to draw an old man in a tank. And that's how Sandland came to be, actually. I don't know if you guys have ever had contact with artists, but that's more common than it looks. Sometimes the ignition for a great project comes from a random spark just like what we have here with Sandland. There was no message, no plot, no story, just the wish of a great manga author to simply draw manga and have fun. Well, that was the idea. Wait, wait, wait. So you're telling me that he didn't have fun doing it? Hold up, calm down. The answer is actually yes. He didn't have as much fun as he once thought. But... Let me explain to you guys in a better way. After Dragon Ball was finished in 95, Akira Toriyama kind of got fed up with long serializations. Well, it's pretty understandable, right? He worked long hours every day to deliver the best he could. So after dominating the whole world, our hero wanted to be more casual with his creations. So after resting for a bit and getting new inspirations, he felt the urge to draw an old man in a tank. Simple as that. So then he started to create a story around that concept. There was only a tiny bit of a problem. He didn't know that drawing tanks would be as hard as it was. So what started as something playful and fun evolved into real frustration. And on tops, he didn't want to use assistance. So he was all by himself, by choice of course. But there he was. Something that I find really funny is that this message from Toriyama is actually at the start of Sandland's volume. Imagine starting a volume knowing these things. I laughed a lot when I saw this. Despite Toriyama's complaints about designing the tanks, the art style is praised as being highly detailed and very imaginative. It's just Toriyama, you know, the design will be perfect, of course. The man was a genius. But after you read Sandland, you can actually feel that Toriyama loses a little bit of gas as the story unfolds, with a couple of, let's say, unusual coincidences to help the plot's closure. But this doesn't spoil your experience at all, because he makes it in a way that is pretty fun and enjoyable, actually. Remember, this is a manga that he wanted to have fun with, so you should not take it too seriously, as the man himself and even the characters in the story don't do so. But it's not because he just wanted to have fun that there is no depth to this piece. Actually, for a manga of the year 2000, Sandland is filled with pretty modern topics. From my point of view, there are three topics that pretty much summarize this manga. First, we have the alarming fact that water is running out and that almost every living being needs it, so we should take care of it. Aligning us with our second topic. Favorite groups should not be in control of water. Water should be a right. You shouldn't be able to sell water if there are people needing it. A very solid critic to something that we see every day. 
And last but not least, Akira Toriyama portrays a lot the concept of prejudices and preconceptions. It's not because someone is different that they are inherently bad or untrustworthy. We see a lot of that in the relationship of the humans with the other races of Sandland, but we will soon talk about that. Sandland is a short read. With 14 chapters compiled into one volume, you can pretty much read it in one go, which I love by the way. So let's get to it. I won't cover the story with all the details, but I'll kind of summarize it. And guys, for real, read this manga. It's short and sweet, while being one of the best portrayals of Akira Toriyama's skills. Not only in the art that is flawless, but on the humor and storytelling too. It's an experience that for sure you will enjoy. Okay, so the premise goes a little bit like this. In the far future, 50 years of natural disasters and war destroyed most of the Earth, leaving only a barren wasteland called Sandland. The river that once provided water to the land dried up long ago, and the supply of water is now controlled by a greedy king. This desolate wasteland is inhabited by humans and demons, with the bottled water sold by the king's government becoming increasingly more expensive for the citizens to buy, the people of Sandland thirst constantly and begin robbing one another for water and money. Tired of the king's greed, the old sheriff Rao goes in search of a long-lost lake presumably located on the south of the country, as seemed to be proven by migrations of water finch. He informs Beelzebub, the prince of the demons, of the existence of the elusive lake which might meet the needs of the inhabitants of Sandland. Along with a wise demon called Thief, the trio goes in search for the Phantom Lake. So here we have an interesting trio of characters. First we have Rao, a mysterious old human sheriff that wants to go against the system. We'll not talk too much about him now, as he has some twists going on. But secondly we have Beelzebub. Oh. Uh, not that one. This one is way more chill than that. Beelzebub is the prince of the demons and that's a breath of fresh air. We always hear demons and already think about villains. But no, here the demons are actually fond of humans. Even the humans hating on them. That is because in this world, the evil doings of demons are not lined up with our cliché idea of evil doings. For Beelzebub, going to sleep late, not brushing his teeth and playing pranks on humans are basically evil actions. So he is much more of a prankster than an actual evil creature. He is pretty kind actually. When his demon tribe needs water, he steals from the military, but he always steals just enough, never more than they need. And he has a very interesting rule, he never kills anything. Life is just too important. So yeah, he is basically a pretty nice 2500 year old kid. And then we have Thief an old demon that helps Beelzebub. He is not as pure as the prince, but he is a pretty fun guy that has the ability to steal anything from anyone. From his name literally being Thief, he has a pretty fitting skill. This story is filled with funny yet interesting characters. From the king of demons Lucifer, which is a straight recycled design of Dabura from Dragon Ball, to the gang of swimmers that are a family of criminals based on their love for swimming, even if only the father have swum before, Sandland has a lot to offer. The characters for sure are one of its strong points, but to me, the best part of this manga is its storytelling. The plot really engages you, it's the perfect balance of you getting entertained while getting curious about what is going to happen. Just the classic Akira Toriyama special. There are a couple of twists here and there, so if you want to read the full piece, pause this video and come back later as we'll talk about the plot. So, remember that Rao asked Beelzebub for help? Well, as I mentioned, it is not common for humans to interact with demons. But he went to the demon village and said that for his plan to succeed, he needed strong foes, as the king would definitely try to stop him with his whole army. Beelzebub hesitates at first, but soon he's convinced by his father. That tells him that Rao seems trustworthy and that this adventure would be a good exercise for him. Soon after their quest begins, their car breaks down as they are attacked by a centipede dragon, which has an amazing design by the way. Oh, and by a group of bandits afterwards. 
Then we get to see that demons are actually way stronger than the regular human being, as Beelzebub destroyed the bandits in a whim. They then see an opportunity to steal a tank from the king's army. Thief then puts on his customized design equipment, use it for his miraculous stealing, a Santa Claus costume. <laughs> yes, he's just a goat. This attracts the anger of the king, who mobilizes his forces to stop them. After stealing the machinery, the demons get impressed by how good Sheriff Rao drives a tank. He then says that he's actually a former general of the king's army, who together with the demons, is able to quickly deal with all the current army's attempts to hinder their progress. And then we have a huge twist. One night, while discussing with the two demons, Rao learns a shocking truth. 30 years ago, the king sent his army to destroy a terrible weapon that was being built by a race called Pichi. The king ordered the use of a big weapon of mass destruction, very much like an atomic bomb. Well, everything for the good of the world, right? Wrong. The machine that was being built by the Pichi tribe would be able to generate water. So they were attacked not because it was a weapon, but because their creation could have stopped the king's monopoly over water. Rao, under his real name at the time, General Shiba, led the assault without knowing the real intentions of the king. The explosion not only killed the Pichi tribe, but the cities nearby and almost all the men of the king in the area. Just Shiba lived on to tell the story. The army thought he was also killed, so he changed his name and just disappeared. He and his men never liked the commander of the king, so that was a nice opportunity for the commander to get rid of all of them. Shiba has to live with the idea that because he didn't know the magnitude of the bomb used, he was the responsible for innumerable deaths, fueling his anger towards the king and the commander. But let's continue. On their way, the trio meets a family of gangsters called the Swimmers. Wanting to earn a reward for the capture of Rao and his companions, the swimmers warn the king's army. Shiba's replacement in the army, General Are, is now in charge of killing Shiba. Initially, Are actively pursues Shiba in order to avenge his father, who died during the big explosion, as he was one of Shiba's friends in the army. A big battle takes place between our trio and the king's men. While Shiba talks with the new general, who starts to understand that the king and the commander are corrupt, the swimmers attack and a big confusion happens. While a sandstorm starts, Beelzebub gets lost from the group as he finds something amazing. Beelzebub discovers that some Peachy have survived it in an oasis whose existence was kept secret for all these years. The elusive lake that Shiba and his friends were looking for. Once they learn the truth about the Peachy and their water-producing machine, Are and the swimmers eventually join Shiba in his quest. As the Phantom Lake belongs to the Peachy, Shiba decides not to take it over, not even a single drop of water, and instead plans on bringing down the king and taking over his water supply that is located elsewhere. Once the trio reaches the water supply at the end of the now dried up river bed, they find a lake that now acts as the king's private reserves. Which is not just a lake, it is actually a whole dam. They are then attacked by an insect man sent by Commander Zeo, as we discover that Zeo is the one who decided and ordered the attack on the Peachy people, to both rid himself of Shiba's disobedient tank brigade and a threat to the king's water monopoly. In fact, Zeo uses the king as a figurehead to rule Sandland. Once Beelzebub defeats the insect man, Are shots Zeo with a tank cannon blast before the later can attack Shiba, finally killing the commander. With the water sealed away behind the dam, Shiba, the two demons, and those sympathetic to their cause, explode everything. With the water returned to the land as a result, the king's oppressive rule is brought to an end, and the king is now forced by Shiba to give his wealth to the people. As I told you guys beforehand, there are one or two coincidences that you just think like, hmm, but how? <laughs> but that does not take the shine away of this beautiful manga. Everything is just amazing. Akira Toriyama cannot be defined just by Dragon Ball. He was more. And actually, he is more. Even with his premature passing, Toriyama Sensei will always and forever live in our hearts. 
thanks a lot, Akira Toriyama Sensei. And rest in peace. Oof, I really wanted to make this video. Because because of this man that me and a lot of people got into anime and manga. I cannot actually put into words. He just means too much for our world. Thank you guys for watching. Leave a like and subscribe for more. Keep surpassing your limits. Don't judge a book by its cover. Keep drinking a lot of water. And of course, keep reading manga. Bye!